All right. Okay, let me see. Let me make sure I got everything that I need here. Um, nope. Uh, hold on a second. Alex, before we get started, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. All right. Hey guys, how, how's everyone doing? Thank you everyone for showing up. My name is Alex Sabio in case uh, we haven't met. Uh, I'm a married father of four. I live here in Southern California, started investing in real estate in like 2004, 2005, made absolutely every single mistake uh, you can make, um, had a bankruptcy, foreclosure, um, and eventually I wanted to start get back into uh, investing in real estate, but I wanted to focus heavily on cash flow because at the end of the day, cash flow is what's going to pay the bills. So eventually, I landed on short term rentals. I've been investing in short term rentals for about a year now, a little over a year, uh, about three months into investing into short term rentals. My wife was able to uh, retire from her W 2 job. Um, and, and within about nine months or so, I was able to replace my income. Um, I currently have two more short term rentals in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee that are being built. And I have two short-term rentals in the Gulf Shores of Alabama that we're closing uh, middle of next month. So short-term rentals have been amazing for me. Uh, that's what I focus in on. Uh, I do invest in uh, multifamily too. I'm a, a limited partner in uh, multifamily syndications because I like the passive aspect of that too. Um, and I think that's where we're, we might move our money to. Uh, I do have long-term rentals out there too. So um, uh, but yeah, that's me. Um, you can find me on Instagram, the real Alex Sabio. You can find me on Facebook. I'd love to talk to you about real estate. So, awesome. Um, hey everyone, I'm Savannah, um, the other half of the admin for the Facebook group, which is I know a uh, reason that a lot of you guys are here. I am a registered nurse and a real estate investor. I got started real estate investing in the beginning of 2020 on maternity leave with my second daughter. Just looking for different ways to create multiple streams of income and passive income. And so my husband and I started investing in single family homes. And then really shortly after we scaled into multifamily and we currently own and operate syndications, uh, really, we were just super motivated to create a business out of it and scale. And we love, love um, what multifamily syndications offer investors, uh, especially passively. So I work with a lot of people who are wanting to get into real estate and really not do a lot of work, like invest very, very passively. Um, also while I was kind of building my brand and, and networking with people through my syndications, I realized there's a huge, huge knowledge gap for healthcare workers, especially nurses and financial literacy. And so really working to build up my brand, the net worth nurse and offer nurses, a bunch of different educational resources and platforms in a community. I have one of my business partners, Kai Arnold, he's on the call. He's part of net worth nurse now. So, um, really on a mission to grow that and just educate people about the amazing benefits benefits um, of real estate investing. So that's also why we have uh, Ryan joining us today because tax strategies are a huge, huge reason why a lot of people get um, started in real estate investing. I mean, Alex said that, but there's just a lot of different ways that you can offset income and just different ways that you can kind of offset the burdens of taxes. So I'm going to let Ryan go ahead and jump in and share everything he knows with us. Awesome. So can everybody see my screen yet? Yes. Okay. You see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. You don't see my, we don't see that your other faces, right? I'm just seeing your faces. Okay. Good. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about building short-term rental wealth using the tax code. But this also does apply to multifamily housing, but not directly. We'll get into that a little bit later. So everybody has heard the saying, nothing is certain except death and taxes. And that's by Benjamin Franklin, I guess. But uh, what if I could tell you that one of those maybe doesn't have to be true? And I can't promise that you'll live forever. Although there might be a healthcare professional in this in the Zoom right now that may <laughs> may have the answer to that. But that's not me. Uh, but I can help relieve the burden of taxes. So my background: I have a bachelor's degree in accounting and one in finance. I'm a certified public accountant in Illinois, and I'm currently house hacking and looking into short-term rentals as far as my investing strategy. I will be able to buy my first investment property with absolutely no money down, as well as I'm going to actually get a check from the IRS. And I'm going to have another webinar just on that alone. And my calling is helping real estate investors boost ROI using the tax code. 
this is a picture of me and my girlfriend. We were actually at a cabin in Pigeon Forge back in May. We went from Monday through Saturday and it was a blast. There's tons of people there and it's, it's bumping definitely in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, Gallenberg area. Uh, as I am in the tax and legal field, this is the disclaimer. Uh, this is prepared for informational purposes only and does not constitute uh, tax or legal or accounting advice. And I encourage you to consult with your own tax and legal team uh, before taking in or engaging in any transaction. So we'll just get some of the boring stuff and legal stuff out of the way. So here's an outline of the topics. We're gonna to talk about how rental income is taxed differently than earned income. We're gonna talk about what you can and can't deduct. We're gonna talk about the keyword cost segregation. We're gonna talk about all the ways that you can qualify for the material participation, the short-term rental tax loophole. We're gonna talk about how to report your activities, the importance of working with a professional, and then we're gonna do a little Q&A. And I ask that if you guys do have questions, let's just save them for the end so that way I can at least get through the presentation on time because I'm sure we'll have a ton of questions. So the first thing that you have to understand with real estate investing is the difference between earned income and passive income. So earned income is any sort of income that you make at say a day job, or maybe you have business income, or you own your own business. Earned income is taxed the heaviest. Earned income, it's ordinary income, it's taxed at the highest rates, I have the tax brackets listed here, but earned income is also subject to what I call the F word, uh, not the bad F word, or not the, not the vulgar F word, but it's called FICA. FICA taxes are, is the working man's tax, I call it. It is Social Security and Medicare. And if you're a W-2 employee, it's a 7.65% tax on wages in 2021. It's up to 142000 It gets indexed for inflation every single year. Now, if you're self-employed, it's 15.3%, as some of you who are self-employed do know that. Um, and over here on earned income side, there's very limited ways that you can do to limit, reduce your tax liability outside of 401k investing, HSAs, and maybe having more babies. There's really no ways you can lower your earned income, but come over here on the passive income side through real estate. It's less demanding than a day job. And there's ability to offset your income by a ton of expenses. Uh, we talk about depreciation. We talk about just your business expenses, the cost incurred to buy the rental property, all these things. It does have ordinary income tax the same way as earned income does. But what does passive income have that the other doesn't is no FICA taxes, no F word, no, no additional surcharge on the income that you make. So that alone, real estate's a great way to boost the, your take-home pay while also lowering your effective tax rate because you're not subject to FICA taxes. And just, I know a lot of people don't like Robert Kiyosaki, but he's really right is the rich don't work for money. If you see any sort of wealthy person's tax return, your Bezos of the world, your Musk, anybody, anybody who's a billionaire, they have nothing on line one wages. They have nothing in earned income. All their income is going to be flowing, coming from passive income, whether it's real estate or owning businesses that they passively participate in. So we're going to do a self-assessment real quick. And this is the 2021 tax bracket. And if I move a little too quick, just, just let me know. But you're going to figure out where you fall at in the tax bracket. This is the federal tax bracket, by the way. If you're in state that does have state income tax, if you're in California, which most of you are, I'm sorry, because you guys have uh, some of the highest income tax rates in the state. But I want you to figure out where you are at in your federal marginal tax bracket, because this is important because it's going to assess what your true after-tax cost is. And I'll explain what that means. But for me, I'm in a 24% federal because I'm a single individual and this is the income range that I fall in, as well as I have a 5% state tax rate. So I have a 29% tax rate. And we'll get into that. What that means is basically think of it as a coupon. Your tax rate is your coupon that the government gives you because it's going to incentivize your cost. So let's say I have a thousand dollar repair bill for my rental property. Well, I would have paid a thousand dollars. I would have paid a thousand rental tax. I would have had a thousand dollars of income. So I would have paid 29% of taxes on that. But because I had a rental repair bill of a thousand dollars, that decreases the amount of taxes I have to pay by 29%. So that thousand dollar repair bill that I had after tax cost, it's only 7,100. It's, it's only 710. I'm sorry, because I get to take the thousand dollars times my marginal tax rate. And that's going to be my true after tax cost. And that's where the thing with, oh, is it a write off? That's what a write off is. It's not, it's not you're getting it for free. It's just a reduction in the tax that you have to pay. So these are a list of things that are 
able to be deductible. Basically, anything, any, any expenses incurred to run the day-to-day operations of your business. So you're going to have your cleaning fees, management fees, utilities, legal professional fees, all the taxes that you pay to localities, property taxes, mortgage insurance. The most, the special one that we like as real estate investors is called depreciation. Depreciation is the way that the IRS is pretty much giving you a freebie. Depreciation says, well, we know that real estate tends to go up in value over time, but the IRS doesn't think that. The IRS knows that the property, the materials inside of that building, as well as the structure goes down in value over time. And if we're talking short-term rentals, short-term rentals are depreciated over 39 years. Your long-term rentals, your, your multifamily, your syndications, your four units or less, non-commercial property is 27 and a half years. So big uh, clarification there. And the way I explain depreciation is it's tax-free cash. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. We call it a phantom expense. You don't actually come out of pocket for depreciation. It's based on your building's uh, adjusted value. It's, it's based on the building's value. And again, you get to take it over 39 years. So let's just say, easy example, $390,000 building. I take it over 39 years. I get $10,000 that I get to use to offset my rental income. And lastly, depreciation is mandatory. It's not optional. If you do not claim depreciation on your tax return, when you, in the event, when you do go to sell a property, the IRS will assess the sale as if you've been taking the depreciation the entire time. So it's just a benefit that we want to be able to take because we have to, right? And it saves us money. So that's depreciation. So let's look at it by the numbers. And I just use a very easy example, because I didn't want to confuse too many people, but on a purchase price of $500,000, let's say that the land is 10% of the purchase price, which actually in the Smoky Mountains, I've even seen it lower. I've seen it as low as 6% sometimes. I've seen it, the last one that I just did, I saw it at 8%. So let's say, but let's just use 10% for our example. So my building, this is what's depreciated, the 450,000 over 39 years. Let's say I have gross revenue of $80,000. And just for simple math's sake, the total expenses add up to be about 60% of revenue. My net operating income for that property, the cash flow is going to be $32,000. The depreciation, if I was to take the building divided by 39 years, I would get $11,000 of depreciation. That's a phantom expense. I don't have to come out of pocket for, and it reduces my taxable income, right? Because I don't have to pay. I can't hear anything. Brian. How did I go on? How did I go on mute? When did you guys lose me? <laughs> like five seconds ago. Yeah. Oh. It was okay. ten how minutes. Did, how, taxable yeah. income. How did how did I how did I go on mute? What happened? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I messed up because I was trying to admit people on here and must. Okay. Up. Okay. Blame okay. it on me. Okay. Yeah. All right. So tax <laughs> taxable income, right? So I have thirty two thousand dollars net operating income. But I don't, I don't pay taxes on 32. I pay taxes on 20. And with this example, year one cash on cash is 26%. But there's a way to kind of accelerate that depreciation, right? Instead of taking over 39 years, we have the option to accelerate it. And it's in the form of what's called a cost segregation study. And I got to plug my guy, Yona here. If, if you want me to, if you want to reach out to him, he's the best in the business. His company, Madison Specs, does thousands of these every single year. And I mean, Alex, I don't know how much would you say, but this guy's probably saved people tens of millions of dollars in taxes by this point. Uh, and if not, even more than that at this, yeah. at this I, stage of the game. I use Yona. Highly recommend. Yeah. But what a cost segregation study does is it looks into that building. Because remember, we're depreciating that building over 39 years. But there's stuff in that, in that, in that property that has that we, we're gonna to have to repair every five years, every six years, every 10 years. And that stuff inside of the property, your pool table, your furniture, those things have the ability to be immediately depreciated, immediately written off in the year that you place the property in the service. So I'm just using an, an example of one that I saw recently. We're gonna take the same figures here, so I don't wanna confuse anybody. So over here on the left, it's the same that I just showed you. But in this example, we're, we're accelerating the depreciation. So instead of taking $11,000 of depreciation year number one, we're taking $112,000 of depreciation. It's going to bring us into what's called a loss. We have, again, same net operating income, but we're taking depreciation. This is going to drive us into a loss. We're going to have taxable income of $80,000. 
tax loss. I'm sorry, of eighty thousand dollars. So this thirty thirty two thousand dollars of rental in income that we have, we don't pay taxes on it. We have a loss. Now, what happens with this loss? So typically, the loss, unless you meet certain requirements that we're going to go through, the loss can actually be used to offset maybe other rental income that you have. Maybe you have a property already, a long-term rental that's cash flowing well. A passive loss from one activity will also offset passive income from other activities. But the best thing that it can be that the best thing that can happen is for you to materially participate, because then we're going to be able to take that eighty thousand dollar loss against our earned income, against our business income, against gambling income, stock income, whatever you want. If you have, if you have non-passive income from a day job, you can use your rental loss that we created by using the tax code to offset that income. And in this example, I'm going to go back to my tax rate. Okay. So if I plug my $80,000 loss that I generated into my 29% marginal tax rate, I get tax savings of 23,345. The government's going to give me a check for that. And not all the time, but it, it's, it'll hash out on your return. But essentially, the government's giving me $23,000 back. In order to assess true cash on cash, I can plug that $23,000 back in to my figures to develop a 44% year one cash on cash compared to a 26%. I've, this is typically the most common. You'll see around 18 to 20%. I've seen this. If you're in a really high marginal tax rate, let's say somebody was in a 37% tax rate, which some of you might be 37% tax rate. You also have net investment income tax. So maybe you're even in a 40% tax rate. This goes up tremendously to where your cash on cash could potentially be 55, 60% in the year you place the asset into service. And that's the power of a cost segregation study. But we have to talk about how do you qualify? So if you just do the cost segregation study and you have the loss, sure, you're not going to pay any rental income on that property. You're not going to pay any tax on that property. You could take that loss and offset other rental property income. Maybe you have a syndication that you have income coming from. Maybe you have long-term rentals, whatever it is. You're going to be able to use that loss to offset those. But you cannot take the loss from a rental property, from your short-term rental against your business income unless you meet these two uh, tests. So the average tenant and your short-term rental has to say seven days or less. Seven days or less. So if you add up the total amount of rental days that you rented out your property for divided by the, by the guests, the amount of guests. Now, this is not the total amount of guests. Like if I had five people stay in my property, this is per, per engagement, per transaction, right? So you might have somebody stay in there 10 days. That's fine. So as long as the average tenant stays seven days or less, that's, that's number one. Number two is you have to meet one of the seven tests to materially participate. There's seven of them. There's two that I like to talk about more than others, just because they're a little bit easier to meet. And here's these two tests. So the golden rule, just so you know, is 500 hours. If you can prove that you spend 500 hours in that short-term rental, you're going to be able to take your losses against your income. If you can't meet 500 hours, this is going to apply to a lot of people that just bought short-term rentals, maybe in, in quarter three, quarter four, and that are just learning, maybe just, maybe you just are learning about this right now. You still have time because last time I checked, we still got two months left, which I think you can get hundred hours within two months. The second test is 100 hours and more than anyone else. And what I mean by this is if you cannot prove the 500 hours, the reason why the 500 hours is the gold standard is because if you can prove 500 hours, you don't have to keep track of anybody else's time. Your cleaner, your contractor, maybe you have a handyman. You don't have to keep track of their time if you can prove that you spend 500 hours. But if you can't spend 500 hours, you have to spend 100 hours and more than any other person. So this number two is less favorable because that means you have to keep track of everybody else's time. You have to ask your cleaner. You have to ask your, your contractor. This is a list of things that count. I don't know if you want to take a picture of it. If you want to, I mean, this is recorded, so you'll be able to go back and, and rewind it and, and see. But long story short, let's talk about if you have a property manager, a day-to-day -day property manager, somebody that's doing the listings for you, that's running the repairs, running the contractors, it is going to be very hard for you to get hours because you're not doing anything. And why did you hire the property manager in the first place? So no double dipping. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't you can't hire a property manager to take all the burden off you and expect to be able to uh, qualify for this, right? Uh, very hard. Another, 
another thing that let's see uh, part one so i have another list here here's the other uh list of stuff that does count is all these stuff so i don't know if you guys want to take a picture of it but let's go back to that right so if you if you if you do not if you do not have a property manager that's more favorable because you're going to have more hours but another thing that a lot of people miss with this is if you have a property manager you're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the management, which means you don't get to count your investor level hours, such as bookkeeping, preparing the tax return, uh, doing the record keeping, paying the bills, collecting rent, investor level activities. You don't get to count if you're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of management. So I don't want to get too further into that because that'll lead to a ton of questions too. Um, last thing before we get into more of the, uh, how, do we, how do we report it? Substantial services. So a lot of people will say, well, how do, how do I report my short-term rental? Does it go on Schedule E? Does it go on Schedule C? And actually, short-term rentals and where you do not provide substantial services, they go on Schedule E unless you provide substantial services. Substantial services is like if you cook and clean while the tenant is staying or while the guest is staying there, that's substantial services. Simply, simply turning the unit over and cleaning it after the guest leaves is not substantial services. Your rental goes on Schedule E. But if you do provide these substantial services, it'll go on Schedule E. Now, the upside to that is we don't have to track material participation if we want to take a loss. But the downside of that is if we do have taxable income, because it's on a Schedule C and it's more like a business, then we're subject to that FICA taxation that we don't really want to be subject to. Most people do not provide substantial services because they don't want to anyway, because that will eat a lot into the cash flow and it's more work to provide substantial services. So I don't see this, but if there are people in the room that do provide substantial services, I just wanted to plug that. So how do I file, right? How do I report it? Well, we just talked about, if you do not provide substantial services, your rental property is going to go on the schedule E of your 1040. If you do provide substantial services, it's going to go on Schedule C, Profit and Loss. And if you have a partnership with somebody else, if, let's say your brother loaned you forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 and you're the one putting in the muscle, right? I, I mean, we've seen this tons and tons of time. It's very common, right? Well, if you both want equity in the, in the property or if you guys both want to have a say and use that income to qualify for more loans, you're going to be needing to file a partnership. A partnership tax return is a form that gets sent to the IRS that basically says, hey, Alex made $50,000, his partner made $50,000. It gets sent into the IRS and then you're going to get a form K-1. This is how a lot of syndication deals are structured. The investors will get K-1 forms and they will report it on their individual 1040. But I wanted to just make a quick note is I've, I've talked to plenty of real estate investors who do own, who do co-own property with other people who do not report it accurately. They either don't file taxes at all, quite frankly, or they, they fail to report it accurately. Now, this is very common to want to do, but let me just tell you why you, you don't want to do it. Number one, it's borderline fraud. I mean, you're not reporting income, right? That's, that's number one. But number two is, let's say me and Alex are successful real estate investors, and we, we've done two or three deals under the table with each other so far, and we want to go to the bank to get that big loan, that $2 million loan, $3 million loan that we want to pool in other people. The bank, we're going to be, hey, bank, we're, we're a profitable business. We're a profitable partnership. And the bank's going to be like, that's really cool. Thanks for telling me that. But where's your partnership return showing that you guys are a profitable business together? And that's just the downside to not having your your ducks in order you want to make sure that you're properly reporting uh, for tax purposes so we want to talk about more strategies to defer recognition of income and i didn't plug this in the beginning but the name of the game is how long how can we defer income as long as possible if i have a dollar i don't want to show it for tax purposes i don't i want to defer it as long as possible legally as long as possible but if i have an expense if i have to come out of pocket for something if I place an asset in the service, I want, to, I want to take the expense right away. So how do we defer income as long as possible, but we want to accelerate and speed up expenses? The first one we'll talk about is cash out refinance. Most, most people are familiar with this, but I just wanted to plug it uh, just in case. I saw this a lot, especially in the, in the Smoky Mountain. I have a client, they, they might even be on this call, I don't know. I have a client who bought three properties, three short-term rentals before the pandemic happened. And they were all bought for around 340, 340 to 380 purchase price. All those properties are worth over $800,000 now. Um, sure, it's been over a year, right? They just became a millionaire in one year by owning three properties. And they were able to do creative financing for a lot of those, right? 
cash out refinances allow us to tap into that equity without having to sell our property, right? Because if that client, if my client sold all the properties, they would have capital gains out the waz, right? They would, they would have to pay taxes on those gains, right? And they lose ownership. They don't have the property anymore, right? They got to go buy a new property. So a cash out refinance is a way to kind of tap into that appreciated value without realizing a taxable event. It's, it's very, it's going to be way faster than selling your property. It's a non-taxable event and you still maintain ownership. So uh, just, just, just an example, let's say I buy a property for, we'll make the math easy. I say I buy for a hundred thousand dollars and the property goes up to $200,000. Well, typically I'll be able to go to the bank and say, Hey, I want 70% of my property's fair market value. I want to check for that 60, 70% of that. So they'll give you 70% of $200,000 in a check that you're going to be able to use. It's going to be tax-free and you're going to be able to go buy more property with that. The second one is 1031 like kind exchange. And this is one of the other common ways. I forgot to mention earlier with that depreciation recapture, when I, when I was selling you guys depreciation and it's mandatory, it's because it gets recaptured when you go to sell the property. A 1031 exchange gets you out of paying capital gains as well as the depreciation recapture. Again, defer income as long as possible, but we want to accelerate expenses. So you get to kick that can down the road on realizing a taxable event. Now you must work with a qualified intermediary. I've probably had a dozen people come to me and say, can I still do a 1031? Even though I have the cash, I just sold the property and the money's in my name. No, you, the, it all gets facilitated through the, the QI, through the person. They hold your funds the entire time through the escrow process. Everything's done with the QI. If you touch that money, it's going to complete, it's going to, it's going to be a Bosch sale and you're going to have to find some other way to mitigate taxes. Um, and then just the timing, you have 45 days to identify a replacement property and you can actually pick out two or three of them that you may want. And you have 180 days to close on that property. So it's just a little timing event, which can be, which can be really hard in a, in a seller's market because those, those, those properties are, are get, are going off fast, right? Three, four days sometimes. I mean, by me, properties were listed. I don't know about you, Alex. I mean, in California, I could expect as well, but by me, properties were getting listed on Wednesday or Thursday and they were under contract by next week. And so 1031 exchange can be hard to do in a seller's market. And the, the third and last strategy we'll talk about is generating passive losses. So when I first started talking, I was talking about how all passive, all passive income can be offset by passive losses. So if I generate a loss on a property that I just bought, I have other properties on the side that are already cash flowing. I can use that loss from my property to offset the income from my other properties. Once, once you have a passive loss, it's all the same regardless of where the where what property it came from. So it's a great strategy to want to accelerate that depreciation. Even if you can't take it against your earned income, you're going to have a huge loss that you're going to be able to use against other properties, or you're going to be able to carry forward that loss to the next year. So let's Let's go back to my example of where, you know, I have $32,000 net operating income the first year because I maybe I placed the asset into service later in the year. Maybe I placed it in Q3, Q4. Okay, so I don't have a lot of net operating income because it hasn't been a short-term rental for a while. Well, maybe I don't material participate either, but I do the cost segregation study. I have $80,000 of, of loss that I can carry forward to next year. So when my short-term rental the next year, when I have it for an entire year, not just Three, three months or four months, I'm going to be able to carry forward that loss, that $80,000 loss to, towards next year's taxable income. So even if you're not able to meet the material participation uh, test, we, we like to see you meet those. But even if you can't meet them, you're still going to be able to take that passive loss and carry it forward to next year to offset your income. And four-step process to wealth building. So this is a little something that I kind of made. Well, First, you want to figure out your leverage. So you, you, you have to figure out how you're going to take advantage of some of the financing, we, you know, the 10% down loans, the secondary home loans. You got to figure out how you're going to take your high earning income potential. Uh, most of the people in here, all the people in here got to figure out how to take that high earning income potential and figure out how to use that leverage that in, in real estate. Because again, people on the real estate side, they're not paying taxes. And you hear this about how Musk and and former president doesn't pay any federal income taxes and you wonder why and most of that it is all passive and most of them own real estate so step number one is leverage you have to you have to get that cash flowing asset that is in demand and it's going to appreciate in value 
strategy. We have to figure out a tax efficient strategy to be making our deals. Because if you guys meet these tests and you're going to be keep buying rental properties and rental properties, you should not be paying any money, if, if, if so little money in taxes, because you're going to be able to use your losses from the short-term rentals against your income. That's going to get you a refund from the IRS. And you're going to be able to use, in my example, $23,000, $25,000 uh, refund or check to go and fund my next deal. So strategy is very important once you do have your operation set up. Alex, I think you were talking about how, was it last year you didn't pay any income tax? Yes, or is it this year? Correct. Uh, 2020. I got so, a, how did that, so how did that work? Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, I got $41,000 back. That's how it works. All the money that you paid in <laughs> from your but W2, I, I, right? I'm using that to go and buy another. Um, right. It's kind of, it, it's crazy because now I'm using that money to help get me more tax breaks. Yep, exactly. So you're using that $40,000 that you saved, you're putting it towards the next down payment. And it's, I almost, I explain it like it's robbing Peter to pay Paul, but that's really what it is because you're able to take these, these deductions and these losses and get this money back in refunds that you're just going to keep snowballing and applying it to the next one. And that's where we talk about scale, right? The, The next point is scaling. So now that you do have this tax efficient way to build wealth, well, how are we scaling that more properties, different, different areas, more tax benefits. Right. And the end game is when we ever, whenever we want to make moves, we have to figure out what's the most tax efficient way to, to make moves. Right. We don't just want to, you know, sell a property without asking our accountant first, like, Hey, how should I go about this? You have to figure out what the most tax efficient way uh, to remove yourself from your STR position. You'll see a lot of real estate investors who are hands-on from the beginning and do a lot of that, but then they want to sit back and just invest in multifamily syndications. Well, they have to figure out how to get from point A to point B. And we want to do that, excuse me, as ta- tax efficient as possible. Uh, so how to get in contact me, with me before we do some Q&A. I'm pretty much active on social media. So I have Instagram and Twitter where I po- um, post a ton of videos there. I do have my own Facebook group. It's called Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investors. And if you want my email address, the email address is there. You can reach out to me. Uh, do reach out to me because I am creating a newsletter pretty soon. And if you want to be a part of that newsletter, I'm going to post a ton of tax tips, everyday tips for the average person. Uh, just shoot me a message to that email and I'll get you added to my list. I don't have a sign up form yet, but um, I'll get you added to my list. And that's, that's, that's it. That's all I have, I think. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Hey, thanks so much for doing that. Amazing, amazing information there. A lot of value. What I could tell you is uh, Ryan, he adds so much value. And that's how I met him. I met him on these Facebook groups and he was just like, ask me anything. And he's like an open book and he, you know, he he just answers everyone's questions. Um, My question uh, for you, Ryan. um, So I'm considering doing a 1031 exchange, but I just purchased my property last year and did a cost segregation analysis. Um, What are the ramifications of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we talked about if you 1031 outright, you, you will be able to remove yourself of having that recapture burden. Um, I would first look to see if you have any other passive loss carry for us that are going to offset your gain, because I see this a lot where a lot of people, a lot of real estate investors hear about the 1031 and they think that that's the first thing that they should jump into. I had, a, I had somebody come to me and say, I'm going to 1031 to get out of this gain. But then I looked at his form 8582, his passive loss form that carries forward the losses. It had $250,000, $280,000 of loss carry forward. So if you do have those losses, you may not even need a 1031 to get out of your tax bill. So it's something to look into. Appreciate it. Thanks. What about as far as depreciation? I mean, I have like depreciation from short-term rentals and then like, you know, long-term rentals, multifamily syndication. I mean, does that just get all bunched up together? Yeah. So if you look at your schedule E, that's where all your properties should be listed at. It'll be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it'll keep going on. Once you have the loss from each one of those properties, those get aggregated to that form 8582. So whether you're depreciating your property 27 and a half years, 39 years, maybe you've got some commercial buildings that's over 37 or 39 years, um, they're all kind of aggregate onto that form 8582. And if you've if you are a real estate investor and you've been doing it for a while, that is the most important form of your tax return. I would say is 8582. It's going to be towards the back. 
but it's going to have all the losses that you weren't able to take from your rental properties because of, because of many reasons, or because you haven't heard about the strategy that we're talking about, but that's the, the your schedule E and your 8582 tell the story. Jessica, I think we have a question here. If you guys have a question, raise your hand and then uh, we'll go in, we'll try to go in order here. I was wondering what the minimal cost of the house would be to make the cost segregation study worth it. Mm -hmm. it for me, I know a lot of people will throw out like 400K, 500K, um, which, I, which I do agree with in a sense. But you, you kind of, in my understanding, you have to look a little bit further. So if I'm just, so my example, I'm in a 29% tax rate, right? Well, if I have a $300,000 property, it may or may not be applicable for me because I'm in a 29% bracket. But if you're somebody in a 37% bracket, a 40% bracket, then it becomes a different conversation because the tax savings and the benefit that you're going to get out of doing the cost seg is going to be more. So I always look at, you know, what, what is the purchase price of the property? But then also, you know, my, my long-term goals for the cost, for my long-term goals of what I want to do. And you got to look at that tax rate, like see what tax rate you're in, because even if the property is say 350, $400,000, you're still going to be able to kick out a hundred thousand dollars of bonus depreciation. And in my example, at a 29% tax rate, that's going to save me almost 30 grand. I'm talking about like a hundred thousand dollar house. Cause I'm just starting. Okay. Um, is it a short-term rental? It's a short-term rental condo. Okay. And do you think you'll meet the test? I'm not really sure. I was hoping to have a call with you this week to kind of figure that okay. out. I'm the only person dealing with all the hosting. So would okay. that be, would that probably meet most, the Yeah, most, most likely. Yeah. You'll probably meet the 100 hour test. Um, there are some DIY templates that are available for doing cost segregation. The only problem with them is they haven't been upheld in audit at all. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't seen a tax court case where the uh, petitioner's tax return was reviewed and they used a DIY, a do-it-yourself cost segregation template. Typically they're done by engineering firms and, and there's professionals that do them. But if, if you could somehow do it yourself, and find a template that allows you for short-term rentals. You know, instead of paying that two thousand fifteen hundred dollars, you could uh, get a template for four or five hundred bucks and do it. Just a thought. All right, thank you. Um, as I said, I'm going to mm -hmm. try to an appointment with you this week. You're my birthday present to me, so make this okay. hour worth. <laughs> Happy birthday! Thanks. All right, maybe we'll go with Patricia. I have a question for you. I'm sorry, my dog is like right here. Um, I bought a short-term rental in um, a Northeast beach area, um, literally, literally just like about a couple of weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I'm still doing renovations. I won't be able to finish any of those renovations till probably the end of the year. Um, what, if anything, could I utilize to, to write off? Because I think that if you can only write out write off up until the uh, up to the amount in which you actually made money, right? So, what if anything could I do, or do I just save them for next year? Thanks. So, do you have tenants, or do you have guests in there yet? No, not? not yet. Still doing renovations. Okay. So, when do you plan on having guests? I'm hoping that I can have it up and running by Thanksgiving, so that I could get some guests in between Thanksgiving and December. Mm -hmm. So the, the property will be placed in the service on the day that you start running it out. That's typically the rule of thumb. So you, you're supposed to capitalize or um, let's see, I'll break this down. So all the costs incurred between when you buy a property and you start getting it fixed up and ready for, ready for guests, those are going to be added to that basis that we talked about, which is less favorable for us because that means we don't get that benefit we get it over 39 years as opposed to being able to expense it right away. Um, by you having the guests in November, that I still think that that might get you to the hundred hour rule. I mean, what was the purchase price of the property? It was 290. So it was, wasn't like super high. Okay. Yeah. So that misnomer of you can only offset the expenses down to zero is it's not true. If you have a, if you have, expenses in excess of your income, it will create a loss. The, the question is just if that loss can be taken against your W-2 or your business income, or does it have to be carried forward to next year? Now, does that change um, if you buy the, if you 
leverage uh, the ability to buy it as a second home? So how you acquire the property, okay, the IRS matter. really doesn't care about. Um, and that's the beauty of real estate because, so in my example, I'll plug myself. So I'm buying a property next week. It's a duplex, it's an investment property. Um, with, with the creative financing and I'm, with the creative financing that I'm doing, I'm actually, I'm actually getting a check from this, from the seller uh, to buy the property. So my, my cost basis is, or my, my out-of-pocket expense is literally zero, but I, the property is worth a quarter of a million dollars. I get depreciation on a quarter of a million dollars, even though I have zero cash in the deal, how you, how you kind of the financing that you do, the IRS doesn't care about. They care about what it was a purchase price. So even though I have no money in the deal, I still get to take depreciation on 250 grand, which is nice. Um, and Another webinar for a different day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, Stefan, let's go ahead. Hey, thanks for having me, Alex. Uh, Ryan, so you, you touched on a lot of points tonight. I appreciate you you, you hosting this. Um, so I I have a, a pretty high uh, tax bracket. I'm in the 37, 40% range. Uh, just bought my first short-term rental three bedroom, two bath in, in Pigeon Forge for around uh, 610. Um, and I, I actually had my consultation with Yona. So this has helped me realize that I definitely need to do the uh, the cost segregation strategy. Um, I think my, I guess my, my question is, is just understanding you can, you can take that straight off of your, your W2 at the end of the, when I file next year, cause like I'm someone who would need that bad because I get taxed very high by the government. Um, mm -hmm. just so like, when do you, so let's just, let's just use your number. You said, what was the purchase price? 610. And, and, um, when are you going to start running it out or you so are, I, I mean, after closing, man, I got it launched within, I would say two weeks. I, I got it up and running pretty quick. My startup costs were around $8,000 mm -hmm. after all, like, you know, couches, all that stuff. And, I got it so, up. And down. We, we made money in, in October already on it, but you know, you okay. got all the real estate costs and mm -hmm. I, I was a so little bit confused, let, I guess, with like what you were explaining between the startup costs and how that it shows on your tax return versus the cost after you start renting it. Mm -hmm. So the IRS basically says any cost incurred between you buy a property and you place it in the service needs to be, um, put on the balance sheet, which is less favorable for us versus the as sooner you get it rented out, those expenses have the option to be expensed immediately rather than adding to the basis of the property. So it's really like a timing issue. I have a video. It, this is more applicable to the Burr method. I have it on my Instagram, but it basically explains how you can use timing to uh, generate more tax benefits by based on when you start advertising your property for rent and you, you, um, do your repairs and maintenance. But to go back to your example, you know, let's say you got a $610,000 uh, a property uh, and it's in the Smokies, you said? Yeah. So the last one I just did came about 10%. So you'll have about $540,000 building basis. And you know, let's assume that you can get 30% in bonus depreciation. Um, that's $150,000 loss. Okay. So that, that loss that you're going to be able to generate, it's going to go towards your W-2. Now, you, that might eat all your 40 or that might eat all of your, um, you're going to be 40% because you're going to be 37% federal. And you have this thing called net investment income tax too. So that's 40% there right off the top. It'll drop you down to the 35, but let's just use 40% because I like doing easy math. So if you had $150,000 loss that we talked about at a 40% tax rate, that's $60,000 that you're going to get back. You're going to be like Alex 2.0. A better. So how does the IRS know when you exactly launched it to determine if there's like, if it was a startup cost versus like after you launched your cabin? Yeah. So all it, it's the, the uh, burden of proof rests on the taxpayer. Like um, it's, it's your job to report it on the tax return. You'll put what date that you place the property in the service. It's more on the taxpayer to kind of establish that if the IRS has questions about that, the, the, then the burden of proof is on you. Um, and that this goes to the same thing, right? Because you don't, when you, when you go to claim this on your tax return, you know, you don't file this huge thing that says, Hey, 
Mr. I am doing this strategy and this is what I'm doing. It just, it just happens and it goes on the tax return and it's going to offset your, your W-2 or your business income, whatever you have, and you're going to get money back. Um, typically the audit, if it ever happens, normally comes three or four years down the road. And that's why I really advocate for keeping really detailed records, uh, keep track of your hours, keep track of your expenses, because the audit's not going to happen next year. It's going to happen three or four years down the road. Uh Last question with this. I know you got a ton of hands up. Um, buy, I'm buying a hot tub and throwing it in the cabin. In terms of now that I have it launched, so that would go on the post right, launching my cabin. So that would be more beneficial for me to now that it's launched up, anything that I put in there could benefit me more on my W-2s. Am I following that correctly? Like, Correct. Yeah, because it's going to be able to be expensed right away. Bon it'll be bonus appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to, because like mm -hmm. I have a 15-year-old, a let's say like AC unit in, in the property. Um, it's probably on its end of its life. I was thinking about replacing it in the first year just because of mm -hmm. the, the tax benefit. Like maybe do it now and get it back, get all the money back. Wait, we have more questions. So it doesn't matter when you do the furnishings or the fixtures, if you do a cost segregation study after you, you put all that stuff in, it doesn't matter whether you had the furniture before you placed it in the service or not. Cause if you're doing a cost segregation, it's going to break all that out anyway. What I'm talking about with the timing issue is if you do not do a cost segregation study. Got it. So I just wanted to plug that. Um, next questions. Stefan, you're killing it. You got to buy two short term rentals next year. So <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Let what, me what, 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 Go ahead. Hey, Ryan, what's up, man? First and foremost, just want to say thank you for um, coming out tonight because this is awesome. Um, so I keep hearing that, you know, when you do the cost segregation, the best thing to do is to um, continue to buy. Well, what happens if you don't? Is, are, is there any I guess, issues? Do you run into any problems if you say, hey, you know, I bought two and, and that's where I'm going to stop, but you did a cost segregation on both? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you, if you do cost segregations and you're taking that loss against your income every single year, you're not carrying forward the loss. So the year that you stop buying rentals, you're going to have all these, all this rental income that you're not going to have depreciation for and your, your taxable income is going to shoot up. And that's why, that's why you, you got to use the money that you save to kind of keep, again, Rob Peter to pay Paul, like keep, keep funneling the money, keep buying new deals because you, when you when you accelerate the depreciation, you're lowering your basis in the asset. You're going to run out of depreciation because you took a lot of it uh, sooner, and that's why it does require you to kind of buy more deals. Because and as we know, short term rentals are cash cows, so it's not unlikely to show seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars of 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 cash flow of net operating income on these. And again, if you're not doing cost segregation studies, you know that's all going to get taxed at passive income, uh, ordinary income tax rates. Okay, I guess so. If a person was looking to just buy one, you know, would you suggest them to do a cost segregation? So I normally explain it as the key to unlocking two different two doors. The first door is: Do you have a lot of rental income that you'd like to offset? So maybe they already have other long term rentals that have been successful, and they're they're cash flowing, and they want to offset the income there. And they're going to be able to offset that short term rentals income, right? So do you have rental income that you're trying to offset? That's that's door number one. If the answer is yes, then it might be applicable to, be, to you. Door number two is, if I have a loss, can I take it against my business income, my day job income? If you can answer both questions, I think a cost segregation is applicable. Um, now, if you're in like a 10 or 12% tax bracket, it is what it is. It's it, probably not beneficial, but you know, I mean, I would assume most of the people here are 24 plus, 22, 24 plus. Ryan, thank you, man. Appreciate it. No problem. All right, Federico. Hey, Ryan. Uh, thanks for everything you said today. So I am like one of the guys that you said in your presentation. I am closing on a property here in downtown Chicago at the end of this week. I plan on doing the renovations, furnishing and everything myself. So I'll easily meet the 100 hours. For the case study here is half a million dollar property. I plan on doing the cost segregation. I within the first two weeks while I'm doing the renovations. I plan on putting it date in service no later than the third week of November. Should I for somehow slip out, let's say mid-December, I've still got two weeks. 
does the IRS care how many guests I have in there? Because the date of service is two weeks from the end of the year. If I have one guy, can I, I still qualify within for this cost segregation benefits? Yeah. So there, there's not like um, a one answer fits all, you know, obviously we'd like to see you get it, you know, maybe it run it out for at least a month. You know, if, if you just have one guest there at like the December 29th, it, it looks a little sketchy, but there's no like, you know, Hey, you need to have this many amount of guests. You need to have, there's no requirement in, in the law. It's really uh, against, I mean, we'd like to see a few different guests, but technically if you only had one or two guests and they stayed seven days or less, and the property is placed in the service before the year's over, you can take advantage of it. Um, at least I would take advantage of it. Whether or not, let's just say if, it, if that was audited and you were in the wrong, you'd, you'd be the first person to get, to get, to be in the wrong for that. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll book your place, man. Just send me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got get, friends lined get, up to book my place. Don't worry. Get, get people in this uh, group to run out your property. There you go. <laughs> Michael Chang, let's go. How's it going? Good, good. Hey, thanks for putting this on. And uh, thanks for the uh, info, Ryan. Uh, I had a question that kind of piggybacks on Lenny the boss's question in that when you do this cost segregation, it sounds like you kind of need to snowball it. Otherwise, you're just going to have huge income down the line that's going to be taxed. What's the end point? Uh, you know, how, how do you mm. stop that snowball? Because if you buy another one, you got to just keep doing it again and again and again. And if you're good, uh, how? Do, what's the strategy to uh, to get out of that that snowballing effect? So, I would say it's a good problem to have, right? Like we're going to be showing a ton of income on our on our tax returns because we ran out of depreciation. And it's, it's going to be passive. So it's not going to be taxed as high as our day job income. And we're still going to be able to offset it with some of our other costs. I would explain it as a good problem to have, um, but how to get out of it. Um, 1031 is, is a good way to get out of it because you're going to be able to defer both the uh, recapture tax as well as the, the, the capital gain. And when you get further into your, in your investing journey stuff I haven't covered on this, this call yet, but there's other, there's ways to kind of defer your, uh, defer your, a gain and kind of swap it with say maybe a syndication investment or, or, or a big multifamily um, or apartment complex, other, other strategies that I haven't talked about on this, on this, because it's um, too, too far in depth, but um, it's a good problem to have, to have cash flow. you know, like you run out. That's because you were able to use those tax savings over the years to buy the assets that you have now. Um, but yeah, it is really a thing where you kind of got to keep doing it and doing it um, again, good problem to have though, I would say. So uh, in the event that you had to sell a property for some reason, let's say you can't 1031 it, you run out of time, you couldn't find a property or you messed up. Um, ordinarily with just linear depreciation, don't you have to pay like 25% recapture tax? Mm -hmm. So that's a good um, thing that you bring up. So there's two different types of, of, well, there's three different types of recapture tax. I'm just going to talk about two of them. So the first one is uh, what's called 1245 recapture. That's going to be on all the stuff that you bonus depreciated. So like the pool table, the furnishings, the couches, all the stuff in there is going to be uh, 1245 recapture tax. Now that has no cap. So whatever your income tax rate is the year that you sell the property, that's what that's going to be taxed at. So if you're, if you're uh, Steven uh, sitting in a 37% tax bracket, when you go to sell your property and you trigger recapture tax, it's going to be at 37%. Um, if you sell the property, and now the depreciation that's allocated towards that building structure, the 39 years is what's called unrecaptured section 1250 gain. That's capped at 25%. Okay. And it doesn't change uh, whatever, whatever you depreciate, it doesn't change whether it's accelerated or linear. Yeah. Whatever you do in the past is kind of what is, is how it sits on your balance sheet and how it determines when you go to sell the property. Now, one of the, one of the things to, to think about is, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'm Steven and I have these years where I'm in a 37, 40% tax bracket and I'm going to be depreciating all my assets. I'm going to be able to take advantage of it at that higher tax rate. And then the year I do go to sell, I want to try to get my tax rate to be lower. So that way the recapture that I pay is less. So you'll see, you'll see a lot of, I have a few people that do this where they're more towards retirement years and maybe they'll sell one asset a year, or maybe they'll, they'll sell one every other year, just because when they go to pay that recapture tax, it's less because they're in a lower tax bracket. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah. All right, Eric, you, let's get awesome. you up here. Hey, how's it going, Ryan? Thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, so we bought property last year in 2020. Uh, for a cost segregation study, study, would it start for this like second year onward or would you go back and amend that year's return and how would that process work? Did you place it into service in 2020? Yeah, I put it in service in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it, what is it, how does it do now? Is it cash flow now? It is, yeah. Okay. Um, you can, you can amend the 2020s. Okay. Got it. Is mm -hmm. that the, the best approach there or how? Um, so me and another CPA actually have differing opinions about how to actually do this. Um, I was always on the assumption that, uh, in order to do what's called a change of accounting method, where you file this form to switch up the depreciation, you have to have two years of an incorrect accounting approach. So you would have, uh, maybe this is too far into detail, but um, there, there are options if you haven't taken advantage of it. But I would say you have to really look into it to see if it um, is applicable because, you know, what was your tax rate last year? Um, do, would you be able to qualify for the material participation test? Right. Um, it's more, more than one thing and just saying, oh, crap, I missed out on it. But like, did you actually want to take it? Like, what was the purchase price of the asset? Did you materially participate? Right. I think we do qualify for mm -hmm. all those things. There's a 430K property. Then the thing is, is can you go back and tell me how you got your 100 hours in 2020? Because I mean, we're talking over 20, 22 months ago. I mean, I don't even know what I ate for breakfast last week. So are you going to be able to get a time log of your hours? Now, again, it's not like you, you're not submitting your time log into the IRS when you go to claim it on your tax return. They're, the audit is going to come three or four years later. They're going to say, hey, uh, Mr. Taxpayer, uh, show us your time record showing that you uh, materially participate in a property. That's the only caveat that I have with people who uh, want to go back and do it is because, you know, how are you going to tell me you spent 100 hours? Like you'd have to go back and recreate that time log, uh, which the IRS allows you to do. You're allowed to recreate your time log. They just don't like when you recreate it under audit. Um, there was a guy who he 20, 2013 return claimed this uh, real estate professional status. And then 2017 got audited and he created his time log in 2017 under audit. There's absolutely no way he could actually tell you what he was doing uh, four years ago, right? Got it. So. Okay. Helpful. Thanks. Chris Burke from Nashville, Tennessee. What's up, man? How's it going? Hey, there we go. Hey, Alex. Thanks for putting this on. And Ryan, thanks for uh, being the guest speaker tonight. Um, had two questions, really. The first was a two-part question question for the material participation. Um, if you have multiple properties, is the 500 hour test total or per property? Um, and how do you handle two spouses working together on it? Is it one, both? Um, and then my second question is uh, separate from that. Are there any things to be aware of when we're using these properties for personal use? Mm -hmm. Any limits so, of time spent there? Let me, let me hit the first the first two, because you kind of served it up on a, on a platter for me. So you can combine your spouse's hours for the material participation tests. So you can count your, your time, your spouse's time. The only caveat with that is you can't count the time that you guys are both doing the same thing. So let's say you guys are both going there to fix light bulbs or do something. If you're doing the same activity, you can't double count the hours. Now, what I tell people to do is if you're going to go visit the property, one of you go in the basement, one of you go upstairs, do different things, and you're good to go. You just can't double count the time. So Spouses hours will count for material participation. So you can count both your hours. The second part where you said is, Hey, I have more than one rental. Do I have to material? Do I have to prove 500 hours or 100 hours in each one? The answer is you have to, if, if I have more than one rental property, I need to make an election on my tax return. It's, it's um treasury reg section 1.469 dash four to group all your short-term rental activities as one activity for the purposes of material participation, because if you're not, if you do not make the grouping election, you do have to materially participate and prove that you spend and meet the test in all of your rentals. So if you had three or four short-term rentals, you would have to prove that you meet the test in every single one individually. You make this grouping election with your tax return, it gets attached to the end of your return, and you're able to do 500 hours total in all of them, and you're good to go. 
so that was the first uh, two parts of the first part of the question. Uh, right, right. So the next part is the uh, personal use. So personal use right. days will count against you if you, so here it is. So it's um, the, anytime a sentence starts with lesser than the greater of, you know, you're in the tax code. Um, so it's, it's uh, 14 days personal use or 10% of the total days that you have it rented out. So let's say I rent it out for 170 days. Well, 10% of 170 is 17. So I could use it personal use days, 17 days, and I'll still be fine. Okay. So it's 14, it's 14 days or 10% of the fair market, or I'm sorry, the, the rental days. And that's um, section 280 cap a that basically, that basically gets around people trying to use a rental property, but then also have it as a personal residence. The IRS is smarter than that. And that's, that's why they made that subsection of the code to be quite honest. And if you exceed those limits, what, what's the implication? So then there's, it, it's called expense ordering rules. And it's under that same clause of section 280A. They basically cut out some of the expenses that you're able to take. Like you definitely wouldn't be able to generate a loss from your property. You'd have to add back some expenses. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time, uh, Ryan? Can you take a... Yeah, I, I, I'm good to go. Yeah. Okay, cool. uh, Lori, let's go. You there, Lori? Oh, can you hear me? There you go. Yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Hey, Ryan, quick question. So are you saying that um, when it when you get the immediate depreciation that um, it would, basically I would get a, ch a physical check back or would it roll over to next year's taxes? So let's say I did, um, I don't have any W-2. I'm only like, I only make money through passive income. So in that case, when I do the cost of pre, I just put these two properties into service um, this year. So um, let's say I do the cost seg on both of the properties. And then let's say it turns out like, you know, the government, like there's $150,000 more or something like that. I would get a check back from the government for 150 or would it roll over to next year's taxes? You wouldn't get a check back because you haven't paid anything into the system yet. You don't have, this is, when I say get money back, I mean, like you're getting the money that you put in through your day job or your business. Um, like Alex got the money that he paid while he's working as a healthcare professional back. If you, if all your income is passive, you haven't even sent any taxes into the government. So in your case, all it would do now, again, if you have other rental income, it'll offset that rental income and you won't have to pay taxes on it. But in the event that you have a loss, it's just going to carry forward to next year. And you're going to be able to use it the year later. Uh, when that property cash flows, you're going to be able to use the loss to offset it. Okay, perfect. Thank so you. So it's not it's not for not, but it's just you're not gonna you're not gonna get a check from the government in my scenario. The only the only time you get a check is if you had a W two job or a ten ninety nine that you, that you've already paid taxes through withholding to the government. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. All right, um, Car, who just uh, is closing on their uh, in Pigeon Forge, right, on a short term rental. Nice. Yeah, that's right. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, that Pigeon Forge, um, Sevierville, uh, Smoky Mountain. Sevierville, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, uh, I'm a, I guess, W-2, and we're buying this property for 854 bedroom, and um, we're closing on it mid-month mid of November, and plan to get it into service shortly thereafter. Um, so... As a healthcare professional, um, I'm in the above 30% tax bracket. I'm trying to log all the material participation hours to reach the 100-hour goal and more than anyone else. I had a question on the material participation list that you uh, gave out because I think Alex posted it in the, the Facebook group and uh, using it on my Excel files drop down. Um, so one of the things on here was travel to owned rentals. Um, do you believe that um, the travel time is going to be a part of the material participation hours? Mm -hmm. um, so very good question. So um, this comes into play. This was actually something I wanted to post for my first newsletter is about establishing your tax home. So having an office like where you're sitting at now uh, will help you when it comes to counting those travel hours. Historically, the IRS doesn't allow you to count travel time. 
I say that historically, but we had a case in 2017 or 2018 called Lay versus Commissioner, where the IRS allowed them to count their travel time. So it's kind of like hearsay. I would advise people to try to meet the 100 hours without travel and only count travel if you absolutely need to. Because again, in the history of case law, they have not allowed travel. But again, two years, three years ago, they did allow travel. So it is what it is as of now. And like I said, I would advise people to meet those tests without counting travel time. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm actually in the process of um, looking for a CPA. Um, I've used TurboTax up until this year to file my taxes and just became a physician attending about a year and a half ago. Uh, we bought a duplex, uh, which is where I currently live and rent out the other side. And now purchasing this cabin in the Smoky Mountains. Um, mm -hmm. Are you available to take on new clients? Would you be interested in doing a consultation? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. Should I'm actually doing the strategy that you are doing, uh, house hacking and then um, short-term rentals. So Nice, very good. Um, should I email you so we can get a set of time apart sometime um, maybe this week? Or, uh... Yeah, you can email me uh, or reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, or the Facebook group, whichever, whichever works best. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Ryan and Alex. No problem. Ryan, I'm getting texts left and right. He's hired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had a question in the group that I wanted to, uh, somebody just says, how do you recommend us to track our house and keep ours? I would say ours, maybe not house, but, um, so there's two apps that I like to track your hours. The first one's called reps tracker, R E P S and then tracker. That's an app you can download on your phone. And the other one is called T sheets. It's just a capital T and then sheets. And these, what these hours, when you do this tracking, you're really going to want to record a few different things. Number one is going to be the date, uh, you know, the day that you, the day that you were there. Number two is going to be the, the location of the property or wherever you were at. Maybe you're at your house performing the activity. Maybe you're actually at the rental performing the activity. So we got date, location. We, we want to know the time that you spent, how much hours, how many hours did you spend that day? And then the last, of course, is uh, what did you do, right? Did, was it bookkeeping hours? Was it uh, hire, you know, hiring the contractor? Was it what type of hours? So four things, we want the date, we want the location of where you were at, we want the amount of time that you spent. And then what did you do? Like, what exactly did you do? And then a bonus one would be, well, let's say you went to the hardware store to go, go do something. Uh, we wanted a receipt. We want, you know, maybe you went to go fix the toilet, um, whatever it is, we, let's get a receipt for it too. So four to five things that we want to track when we're counting our hours. Now back to the hours, the hours have to be reasonable. And and I say this because, again, the audit is going to come down the road. It's not going to happen like a year after. Um, it's going to be three or four years down the road. And there was a tax court case where the uh, petitioner said that it took them 13 hours to install a toilet, like a, a, a toilet. Now, I don't know about you guys. I, I'm not very handy myself, but I know damn well if I tried installing a toilet, it wouldn't take me 13 hours. So it has to be reasonable, right? You can't just make up hours. You can't, you know, you can't lie because the IRS will deem you credible and they'll throw out all your hours. There was another, there was another instance where a taxpayer had said that they were servicing their rental properties. The IRS actually pulled their credit card statement, credit card records, and the, the taxpayer was in England. Uh, at the same time that they said that they were performing rental activities at their properties in South Carolina. Um, I don't know about you, but I can't time travel yet. And the IRS doesn't think that either. And uh, just lastly, there was a taxpayer said it took them two hours to uh, buy coffee filters um, at, at a store. Um, now, I think coffee filters are pretty simple. Um, I just buy the cheapest ones that there is. Uh, obviously, the taxpayer didn't think so. Um, the IRS definitely didn't believe it. But so again, just to say you want your time to be reasonable when you're keeping your time log. All right, Harry. Harry always has good questions. What's up, Harry? <laughs> How are you doing, Alex? Thanks again for hosting this. Hi, Ryan. So um, I'm trying to piggyback, uh, I think, Stefan's email earlier. So if, if, if you are a high W2 income earner, right, and you, mm -hmm. uh, and you get something in the, uh, um, if you get an STR, let's say you spend 800K um, and, you go, and you do cost sec, um, does it mean that using your previous example, you will get a check for 60K from the government? 
Um, it all depends on your tax rate. That's all sure. it really depends on. Yeah. Sure. Got so it. You, Got it. You'd figure out what that loss is multiplied yep. by your marginal tax rate. Yep. And it might even flex a little bit. Like, let's say you barely broke into a 37. Mm-hmm. It's going to take you down to a 35 and then you take yeah. the depreciation times a 35. So it, it, it varies depending on the taxpayer. Of course, uh, of course. And Alex example, it is what his tax rate is. So same sure. sets of circumstance um, versus um, Stefan versus Alex. Yeah. Uh, he's going to get more because he's in a higher right. tax bracket. Understand. Yeah. Understand. So just be, so basically, uh, you got you got all the tax that you got you already paid through your uh, W-2 back, basically. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, okay, got it, thanks. All right, Josh. Um, all right, well, thanks, Alex, for hosting this, and thanks, Ryan, for all the knowledge. Um, quick question for you. We, are clo- we, we close on a property in Yucca Valley, Joshua Tree area at the end of September. Unfortunately, they changed their permitting process to where I can't operate in the pending phase. I have to wait for a 60 day approval, which mm-hmm. will basically mean, and I just submitted that today and we're basically at the end of October. So we won't assume that we won't be operational until Christmas, right? If I'm going worst case scenario. Hold on a second. Are you rocking a baby to sleep right now while you're listening to this? <laughs> I had a baby five <laughs> days ago. <laughs> Congrats. I think Congrats. that's hilarious. Thank you. That, you. that you got on here to listen to me talk about tax when you're trying to put a baby to sleep. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm glad I earned brownie points. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, but yeah, we uh, it's a 60-day permitted process. I just actually mailed it. I heard about the other one off the daycare today. But um, since you won't have a date of service, I think, as you say, and this is our first short-term rental, the rest of my properties are long-term rentals. I mean, they might just now, is the best case scenario. And both my partner and I work W-2s. And so ideally, we'd like to offset our W-2s with the short-term rental income. Mm -hmm. Um, Should we then just basically pause on all the losses? I mean, we bought the furniture this year and obviously doing rehab and things like that. seems like we're probably all in around like 120K into this project. So I'd want to offset as much of that stuff as possible with our W-2s. Mm-hmm. So two things, what I would do off the cuff is I would wait to place it in a service until 2022. Like I wouldn't rent it out until 2022, given your facts okay. and circumstances, because you're not going to be able to prove material participation this year because you just don't have enough hours. Number two is you mentioned a partner the, the rules get a little bit more complex when you're working with others, because only one of you can mature, materially participate in that rental activity in a partnership. Um, uh, um, it gets, it gets a little bit more, um, complex because you know your partner is going to want to get his hours because he's going to want to take the loss against his income and you're going to want your hours and only one of you can actually materially participate in that activity so it gets a little bit more complex and oftentimes you, you'll have to have more properties uh, in order to mm-hmm. be able to, to use that property's loss against your your income but regardless if you can't prove material participation again we still have mm-hmm. a loss we're going to be able to use your other you know offset other rental income or future rental income so it's not the end of the world but okay. I, I mean, beside that, I would, I would try to schedule your first tenant in 2022, place it in the service then. Okay. Well, that's good. It's a good thing that we agreed on two properties. We'll try and get both launched next year. <laughs> um, I have the same sets of circumstance with some other client. And it, now if you guys both material participate in your own rental activities, then, then you're good to go. Right. If you guys each, mm-hmm. you have separate properties. Um, but if you, mm-hmm. if you're one partnership owning two properties, then you're, you guys are going to, one of you is going to have to participate in this one. The other one's going to have to do this. Yeah. One. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. We both have separate long-term rentals, but this is both of our first term rent, our first short-term rentals. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's together, obviously, but ideally, you know, one's taking a loan for the first one. She's going to take a loan for the second one. Um, but okay. Two properties is best case scenario. Thank you. All right, Stephanie, jump on here. She's blowing up. So she's got questions. Uh, I don't have that many, but hey, Ryan, um, I understand that with, um, if you arbitrage a property, the tax deductions are the same as if you own it minus the depreciation. Can you use arbitrage, um, like the, the hours you put into that property towards material participation? Mm, you said because minus also- the, you said minus the, minus the, the what? The depreciation? depreciation. I, I own and I also arbitrage too. So I'm wondering if I could combine both of them towards material participation to get mm-hmm. 500 hours. 
That's a really good question because you have two different types of activities. So you have a, uh, what seems to be me, a non-passive activity by doing the arbitrage. And then you're going to have your somewhat passive activity by owning the properties. You're not going to be able to count those hours with your passive activities. That's just what I think on service level. Um, yeah. Even if it's being ran as like, as if you own it, as far as operation goes, just because I, I know it gets kind of hairy with the arbitrage. That's why I'm asking for um, an opinion because I've heard different things. Mm -hmm. um, so the other rentals that you have that you own them outright mm -hmm. and then you arbitrage. Yeah. I would have to get back to you on that. I couldn't tell you <laughs> off the top. Yeah. Because it has happened in the before too, where um Let's say I'm a, let's say I'm in Savannah's multifamily syndication deals and I'm getting the I'm I'm getting kicked back these huge losses, right? Well, I'm not going to be able to take the losses against my income unless I do the material participation. So there has been people that will go and buy one little one little rental property, get their hours there and then group those activities, like syndication activities with their rental property and be able to take the loss. Um, but I would just have to look into it a little bit more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. All right, let's close it out with Tony, my good, good friend up there in, in San Francisco. What's up? Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Ryan. Just a few questions here. Um, first one's simple. For material participation, I have my Google sheet, but um, do you have a recommended chart of accounts? Because I have like my descriptions, which are kind of all over the place. Does it matter? Uh, mm. Do you recommend like a specific chart of accounts? Yeah. Um, so one interesting, I didn't even talk about this yet. I, sorry, but um. Research and education hours don't count. So time spent like um, looking at other properties or time spent kind of doing research, those really don't count because they don't, they aren't involved in the day-to-day -day operations to keep the property up, uh, up per se. Um, but when you do uh, keep your hours, um, kind of keep the category up. So let's see if you're actually turning a wrench and doing the repairs yourself, or maybe you're doing the listing activities. As long as you have your hours broken out and you're not including any sort of research and education hours, Maybe another subset of ours is, you know, time spent being a financial manager. Maybe you're, you know, keeping the books, collecting the rent, um, paying bills. Those type of, those are more like investor level hours, investor activities. So it's really like you have, um, I would say you have investor level activities like that with financials. Then you have like operations activities such as, you know, calling the contractors or, or booking the listings, things to make the property go. Whereas like on the financial operations side of things, that's not necessarily keeping the thing go. It's more like on the behind the scenes thing. Different, different categories. Got it. So kind of mm -hmm. investor level operator are good. And then lower tier is like re research education doesn't count. And travel, you said, doesn't count. Is that correct? Yeah. So historically travel doesn't count. Although, like I said, we had a tax court case that did allow them to count travel. And so it's kind of, it's kind of hearsay. I, yeah. I recommend clients to get the hours without having, without counting travel as, as per now. Yeah. Got it. And I have just two follow-ups. One is related to debt to income ratios. Um, sure. Yeah. So I bought one in June. Um, I'm closing on another in mid-November. So I heard that you need one and a half months of rental income to, for it to count toward your debt to income for your 2021 tax returns. Is that true in your experience? Or so like when I put it, let's say I put it into service um, December 1st. So I only have one month of rental income in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, and 2022 comes around and I'm using you to file my taxes or whatnot. And then someone, or I'm trying to buy another property in 2022 and the lender comes back and says, we can't count this income or the average of this income divided by the average rent rentable days in that year. Uh, you just kind of count all that debt against uh, kind of your income. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I would probably agree with that. Like if I, if I'm a lender and I'm looking at it and you only showed me one year, uh, one month of you being profitable. Right. I mean, who, who wants to count that? Um, yeah. now it's all going to depend on like your, your relationship with the lender and how well you know them. Um, and Alex could probably speak to this more than I can. Uh, but, um, it, it's really, if you find out maybe a more lender friendly, uh, person, a short term rental lend, they're going to know that, uh, that you've only had the property in a few months of operations. But you know, if I, if you were to come to me and say, Hey, I want to, I want a loan. And you've only showed me that you had a profitable business for two months, I'm going to be like, well, I mm -hmm. think it's risky. Right. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then the last thing I had was um, on carry forward cost seg. So let's say you have, um, um, I say like uh, two short-term rentals 
And I, someone might have asked this earlier, but I joined late. So apologies if this has already been answered. But um, is it advantageous to take cost segs up front, given that laws may change in the future or whatnot? And let's say you have like an 800, yeah. 500K. Mm -hmm. uh, you, just um, get it done, you get it done all at once and then just carry it forward or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in, that's interesting. Like if you're if you think you're going to be in short term rentals for the long haul, um, it definitely makes a lot of sense to get it done right away because it's going to be the easiest to do it right away because you're not going to have to go back and do any. You know, let's say you don't do the cost seg and then a few years later you're like, crap, I probably should have done that. Um, it would you're going to be kicking yourself if you didn't. But another thing to keep in mind is at the end of 2022. 100% bonus appreciation uh, kind of sunsets. And so after 2022, it, it goes down to 80% in the first year. And then later it goes down to 60% and then it goes down to 40%. So if you're not doing your cost segs until after 2022, the maximum you're going to get is 80% of that bonus appreciation. So to your point, like maybe it will make sense, even if you're carrying forward the loss to get it this year. Got it. And so like, let's say you get, I don't know, 30% uh, of purchase, 25% of purchase price back on 1.3 million. Let's say you don't make like 300, 400 K let's say you get, you know, does it, does it, does that excess carry forward into your next year's W2? Like in my 2022, 2020? No, um, no, unfortunately not. So oh, okay. um, you have to be now there's, there's not really writing on this per se, but um, it kind of follows this mirrors the same rules for real estate professional status, which is completely different, but real estate professional status says um, you have to be, you have to materially participate in the year that you have the loss. Uh, mm -hmm. It does not trigger carry forward losses from prior years in which you were not a real estate professional. So let's, let's use an example, right? Let's say I have millions of like a, you know, $500,000 of passive losses that I'm carrying forward. One year I be, I meet those rules. I'm not able to take all that $500,000 that I was carrying forward against my active income. I can only take the loss that was generated that year against active income. It is very, I actually had somebody post that on my Facebook group and was, they were advised by a different CPA that they could do that. And in fact, um, they couldn't. Um, and I cited the source and it's actually in the passive activity loss technique guide that is given to auditors when they come out to audit you. So um, good luck arguing against that point because it's right there in clear writing. So. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Super helpful. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I think with that, we're going to wrap it up. Right. So much value there. Thank you so much for Ryan. Uh, at one point, I think we had over 106 people join in and uh, a lot of people stayed almost the whole time. Uh, we're going to post this thing on YouTube soon. Uh, I think Savannah is like uh, recording that and she'll put it up um, whenever, I think probably within a day or two. Um, Ryan, he's also in the Facebook group, the healthcare professionals investing in real estate. Um, so you could hit him up there. He's also on very active on Instagram. Uh, learn like, uh, learn like a CPA, right? Is that what it is? Yep. Yep. Um, so, and also our next meetup is pretty cool. We, we do our, um, the social meetups, uh, once a month, uh, um, first Monday of the month, but I'm actually going to Pigeon Forge. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tour the uh, short-term rental. If you guys don't know what a short-term rental looks like or how it's set up, uh, we're going to do like a, the first 10, 15 minutes or so. I uh, have a few investors that wanted to tag along. So they're staying in the short-term rental uh, just to experience it and see what that's like. So hope, just check your emails or, or check the Facebook group. I'll, I'll, I'll post and market it. Uh, so that way you guys get the link for that. So uh, anything else, Savannah? Nope. That was it. Yep. I'll be Thanks, uploading it onto the YouTube channel tonight and then I'll drop all of Ryan's uh, contact information there as well. All right. So I think that's it. So um, with that, I'll see you guys. Hope you guys have a good day. Bye everyone. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us. Bye everyone. It was great. Thank great you time. so much, Ryan.